next, Michael Schertz. All right, so I'm selling things a little bit differently here in that um, we've got a range of tools in my group uh, that we use to look uh, computationally at um, atomistic details of molecular association. Uh, we've worked with a number of problems such as looking at protein interactions with polymer brushes uh, with uh, Dan Schwartz and Joel Carr, uh, protein peptide interactions uh, in chemical engineering, protein peptide interactions with Deborah Wutke. And um, so what we're really looking for is collaborators who you know, have some interesting problem where the molecular details are important um, and, and use molecular help showcase our methods uh, in, in the process of that. So uh, we use atomistic molecular modeling to model configurational ensembles to really get the configurational ensemble of a, of a biophysical uh, problem at the molecular level. Um, I think our expertise, you can share some papers, we're really at the forefront of developing a lot of these approaches for calculating the inviting free energies. Um, so we don't have a single project we're working right now. We've worked with um, uh, Samaki in chemistry, uh, Watke Biochem, uh, also working on non-biological applications of these approaches uh, it, with, with Doug Jin and Rich Noble in chemistry. Um, so really what we're looking for is collaborators with compelling problems that molecular insight is oops, type of that, is, is required for. Um, we have some NIH funding for some of these, but really we'd be, really what we're looking for, um, any system where there's compelling physical questions inaccessible to experiment that involve molecular conformational ensembles uh, with the impact really that we want to help collaborators find compelling hypotheses from inspection of these molecular details. and. Um, you know, rationalize experimental successes, failures. A lot of these are not quite high throughput enough to really do sort of molecular design, though they're getting there. Uh, the, the more useful part right now is rationalizing uh, successes and failures. And, you know, a lot of times people are interested in having some modeling. So it reviewers, you know, if, if, it's, if it helps you just to get the proposal through and it's an interesting question, we can help answer. That's uh, the sort of thing that we're interested in doing. So. Um, yeah, that's what we're looking for is collaborators who have those problems and then we can collaborate to help solve them and showcase what we can do at the same time. That's it. Thank you. Next we have Ed Lau as our presenter. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name is Edward Lau and I'm a new assistant professor in CU Andrews Cardiology. And um, my lab is interested in how different cell types communicate with each other through extracellular signals that they release, uh, primarily in relation to the heart, uh, where there are three major cell types, the cardiomyocytes, the endothelial cells, and the fibroblasts that make up the majority of cells in the organ. Um, in the cardiac field, there has been a lot of interest in paracrine signaling because of its role in regenerative therapy and also cardiac development. But up to now, really, there hasn't been a lot of work done to, to understand the exact molecular components that are released by each cell type at different time or under different physiological states. And this is in part due to technical challenges. For example, traditionally, it would be very hard to tease out which cell type did a particular molecule in the plasma really come from. Um, and our approach is, is to use uh, human induced blueprint and stem cells or IPSCs, uh, perform in vitro differentiation protocols to make these cell types individually in, in different dishes so that their respective contribution to secreted molecules can be dissected separately in, in the lab. And with these cells, we have applied an optimized number of workflows to collect and, and process the culture media and isolate extracellular vesicles in order to discover the, the molecules that are contained in these vesicles. And in some ongoing applications, we have found that, uh, for example, microRNAs that are specifically released by iPSCs but not cardiomyocytes and vice versa. And we show that we can use, the, for example, the ratios of, of an iPSC-specific microRNA, uh, like MIR-302, and a non-specific microRNA that ubiquitously released, like MIR-16, to derive a, a quantitative measure of, of the proportion of iPS cells in a co-culture down to maybe 0.1% or less of iPSC. Um, so this could, for example, be useful to identify potential cell contamination in a cardiomyocyte production system uh, for regenerative medicine purposes. 
And in terms of, of teams and collaboration, uh, currently we have experience in iPSC models and doing total RNA sequencing and proteomics from the medium and analyzing the data with some bioinformatics. Uh, and really we are looking for new collaborations in different areas. Um, uh, for example, uh, if, if someone is interested in computational modeling of the data to predict uh, the trajectory of cellular differentiation or an engineer to, to improve either cell culture or how to harvest the vesicles. And we're currently supported by the department and division and also have an, uh, an NHL BI R00 that funds a related project that supports personnel. So we're looking to submit a, a seed grant application here to support reagents to, to develop the project further. And hopefully uh, can also do a joint external application in the future through NHL BI or NIGMS uh, using preliminary data from the seed grant. So uh, for, for outcomes going forward, we want to, to apply this framework to different areas. For example, you know, uh, one question we're asking is, could we use extracellular microRNAs and nanomolecules as an early readout to predict you know, progression and quality of, of, of cell production? And also want to look for extracellular signals that correspond to disease status and use that to monitor cellular health and drug response over a longitudinal period of time. Uh, I look forward to you know getting in touch and potentially forming a new collaboration on campus and, and, and with Boulder. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We're moving right along. Uh, Frank Barnes is our next to last presenter. Okay. Uh, we've been looking at the use of weak electric and magnetic fields as a way of changing chemical reaction rates and the most directly applicable um, <clears throat> result we have, <clears throat> excuse me, is changing the growth rate of cancer cells. We can in inhibit the growth of uh, fibrosarcoma cells by more than 40% by applying signals uh, that are <clears throat> And 200 microtesla, which is about four times the Earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> and we can change the numbers a bit, change the frequency, and we can accelerate the growth of these cells. We've also shown we can change the growth rate of bacteria and, vac and viruses. And so what I think we have is potentially a new tool for modifying chemical reaction rates <clears throat> in biological systems and particularly changing reactive oxygen and species of various kinds. And so we're clearly interested in people in, in two directions. One, both uh, in getting at some of the chemistry and modifying processes, biological processes, particularly involving reactive oxygen, other signaling molecules like calcium and uh, OH minus and nitric oxide, et cetera. And secondly, applications where having a non-invasive sensor might be of most interest. And Joseph Mill in uh, chemistry and Mark Hernandez have been working with me on in the Boulder campus uh, and uh, Mark in civil environmental engineering, particularly with the bacteria. So we have a, we think a potential tool for both accelerating and inhibiting it. And what's different than been had in many times in the past, we have a theoretical basis for which these might work in changing reactive, uh, and a Zeeman shift and some physics under it, and also the effects of feedback with a time delay. So we're looking for both applications and for uh, getting at the fundamentals of understanding the processes by which we might be able to use electric and magnetic fields. A side issue is potential health effects of exposure to wireless, particularly with 5G coming out. And a lot of stuff that's talked about this is either says it's completely safe or it's absolutely deadly. And there's a lot to be understood in that area that's not there. We've been currently funded by DARPA we have the potential sources of funds in NSF, NIH, and possibly elsewhere. We'd be very much interested in collaborating with people who might go so take us from, say, cells to mice to humans, for example. I think it would be interesting and possible that we might be able to inhibit the growth of breast cancer non-invasively 
by over 50% if we optimize some parameters. So those are things to be explored. And I think there's a lot of interesting and fun possibilities here. I'm very much interested in hearing from anybody who might be interested in exploring this farther. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Jim Sisper. Sipser. Very good, thank you. I'm uh, the CEO of Cirque Cryotech, and I'm standing in for Tom Johnson, who is a tenured faculty at the Institute for Behavioral Genetics on the Boulder campus. And the problem that we were interested in is that agents that are used to uh, preserve things in the cold, cryoprotective agents, are actually toxic. So things that are stored in the cold can be brought back to the functional temperature and lo and behold, some of them are not there because of the toxicity of the cryoprotective agents. The way we decided to approach this problem was to use a platform, that is to say a high throughput platform composed of mouse embryonic stem cells. And we were able to use that to screen, let's say to select for mutants that were resistant to cryoprotective agents. For example, M22, a vitrifying agent that's uh, hopefully gonna be used someday to uh, cryopreserve entire organs. In the meantime, we're interested in the less ambitious goals of increasing the, the uh, return on uh, cryopreserved cells and tissues. We found six mutants and one of those mutants seems to correspond to a biochemical pathway which has a drug application, and we're interested in a drug of interest. But uh, we, I wanna stress that our platform can actually be used to screen against a wide variety of toxicities. In fact, we already have published results indicating that uh, screening for resistance to reactive oxygen species, such as hydrogen peroxide or PowerQuat, has resulted in finding mutants that could be generated into whole mice which in turn have cells that are resistant to reactive oxygen species. The reason I mention this is because although we're interested in cryopreservation applications at the moment, we'd be interested in collaborating with people who are dealing with other toxicities such as ischemia reperfusion in models such as surgery, uh, limb reattachment or reconstructive surgery. Because of that, we're looking at funding from the DOD. Uh, we will participate as CERC, the company, in the Lab Venture Challenge. And we may resubmit a grant from the, to, to the uh, National Institute for uh, Kidney and Digestive, to, excuse me, Digestive Diseases. Uh, we're also interested in the cryopreservation of stem cells and cord blood and the challenges that are met there. So if you're interested in this technology, please get in touch with us. Thank you. And thanks to all of our presenters. This was a really um, very wide, varying group of people and excited to hear more about all of your work. Hopefully there are things that you've seen today that uh, you could connect with, but also if you feel that one of your colleagues uh, might be interested in one of the presentations today, uh, feel free to get in touch with the presenter, get in touch with Diane, Liddell, or myself. Uh, we can help make connections and hopefully connect people who are looking for collaborations. Thank you again. I just wanted to make mention of how you can all get involved in the AB Nexus. Uh, as many of you know, we have the grant program that is coming up. The first cycle is this fall, uh, September 14th. We'll have a notice of intent due, uh, and that's just a short form to let us know you're planning to apply, describe who the team is, um, and a brief abstract of what your research project will entail. The full application, which is about four pages, is going to be due on October 16th. And then for those of you who won't be able to apply this cycle, we are going to repeat the grant cycle in the spring. So um, if things don't come together for this fall deadline, um, you can look forward to putting something together for the spring. Uh, we'd also ask anyone who is not applying for the grant program to consider signing up to be a reviewer. Uh, junior faculty are especially encouraged if you're looking to gain experience um, in reviewing, anything like that. And then here's a link to sign up to receive 
our news and events. So as we hold things like info sessions uh, or this research blitz event, um, we can be made sure to be made aware of them. Other than that, just thank you all for attending, for presenting, uh, and Diane and I will look forward to hearing from you, helping however we can. We will be posting the recording to our website uh, of all of the presenters who are okay sharing the, their information publicly, uh, but let us know if we can help make any connections, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you kindly, everyone.